Ah, I love you, Cleveland. And I love you, Ohio. And a very pleasant welcome to this week's version of Bonus Time with Drennan here on the Big Play Sports Network. Great to have you with us. I'm back in the studio. It's wonderful to be back in Cleveland in our beautiful studios here in downtown Cleveland at Burke Lakefront Airport. I said to my wife when we were driving back from Florida, I said it was glorious. It was wonderful. It's always great to come home, but watch, we'll come home to a blizzard. Now, I don't know if I would categorize this as a blizzard, but I certainly... And not used to this kind of weather that I have been exposed to these last few months, Ryan. Ryan uh, is my uh, producer, of course, and uh, great to see you in person. Yes, Bruce. For a change. It, it's been quite a while, a few months at that. Um, I, I'm sad for you that the weather uh, didn't cooperate. You didn't bring the sunshine with you in Florida. I thought you were going to. Did too much in your luggage? You couldn't sneak it in there? Well, uh, nobody's shedding any <laughs> tears for me, and I don't expect anyone to because I thank God that I'm able to do this at this portion of my life. But I have paid my dues, you know. I, I believe it. I believe Remember, it. Remember, I have the record for being fired more than any other broadcaster in the history of Cleveland Broadcasting, radio and TV. Nobody's come close. <laughs> and there's still a possibility being adding to that list, you know. Well, I certainly hope not. But in the meantime... We are back in the studio, and I'm glad to be home, and uh, the weather will be breaking for all of us very shortly. It is officially spring, is it not, Ryan? It is. I believe today is the first full official day of spring, although if you look outside, you would not be able to That's tell. That's all right. That's all right. And as I look outside, maybe a topic that we can talk about is this new stadium that I've been hearing about. And will that be here? Will it be in Brook Park? That's down the line. Uh, we are going to feature my pal Matt Fontana here in just a bit. Uh, we have an array of topics to cover today. Uh, obviously, the NCAA tournament is already underway with those play-in games last night. A couple more tonight. And in earnest, the tournament will get underway tomorrow. So we'll all be glued to our sets. Uh, those are thus that uh, um, can do so um, all day, all night, um, over the weekend. These first two rounds, of course, are going to be interesting. There'll be upsets. Wheeler always is. But we're going to talk about that. Uh, and also a um, little bit uh, on the Browns, a little bit of news on the Browns since uh, we were with you last week and I was still down in Florida. Uh, also with Matt, I want to touch upon the Cavaliers and um, uh, the Guardians. Uh, uh, baseball season is upon us. As a matter of fact, Ryan, do we have a final on the first game of the season. The Dodgers and the Padres opened up the season today in Seoul, South Korea. And Park, I think, threw out the first pitch, uh, the former Ranger, and it, it was a very... Uh, and I think the Padres were winning. I think Bogart's got a clutch RBI single to give them the lead before I left home and came downtown to our studios to do the show today. I think they were leading the game. I don't know uh, since then. Uh, do we have an update on that, Ryan? We do, Bruce. The, the, the Padres did get on the board first in the bottom of the third. However, the Dodgers did pull it out as they rallied. They won 5-2. to 5-2. to two. So five that was it two. for the Padres. That was Darvish. Uh, starting um, against Glass now. So uh, quite an opening. And I believe Yamamoto will go tomorrow against Musgrove for San Diego in game two as um, you know, Manfred has this gl uh, glorified idea that he's going international since the NFL has had so much success in London. And so we'll see how that goes. But it's a home game today for one team and a home game tomorrow for the other. So to even it out. Well, it, it gives me great delight to uh, uh, welcome Matt Fontana, the host of the Matt Fontana Show here on the Big Play sports network matt and i now go back quite a few years in broadcasting we hosted a show together on local radio and here we wind up uh, we uh, find ourselves uh, winding up on the big play sports network matt good to have you with us my friend i'm and, so uh, happy to be here bruce i hope to not join the list that you were talking about earlier but i got one on you for you on that the other thing i want to ask you about talking about the uh, the baseball game this morning there was a big turn in the game the first baseman the ball went through his mitt. It broke his mitt, and the big debate this morning, should that be an error? I know you are a baseball purist. It's your favorite thing, but it's they don't charge an outfielder an error when they lose it in the sun, or if it's a bad hop on the infield, they don't charge it. They think it's a little crazy that the first baseman was going to catch a line drive. It went broke his mitt and went straight through. It I mean, was a line drive or was it a ground? It was a line drive. 
So it would have been an out. So they charged that an error because the play was not made. They and did it's a, charge it, an it's error. It's a big huh? debate this morning uh, uh, on the people of if that should be an error or if that should just be <laughs> a you know broken mid base hit. I don't I know. I don't know if we differentiate between if that was a ground ball and a liner like you say or not. Uh, I would think a grounder should be considered an error. I mean, um, and isn't it not? the responsibility of that fielder to check out his equipment before he takes the field. I, I'll listen to it. I understand where you're coming from. So, yeah, they they did charge him with an error, so it sounds like you're on board with that. It, it didn't turn out to be an unearned run, I hope. Uh, I don't know because it – I think that kind of – no, because I think Otani messed up on the bases and then they got him out after that inning anyway, so I right. don't know if it actually led to runs or Ohtani, not. Otani, oh, my yeah. God, the Dodgers, Otani. And and by the way, in the third segment after Matt departs, uh, um, I'm going to uh, predict as I've been going through all the divisions here on the show from week to week to week. Today I'm going to look at the second toughest division in all of baseball, there can be no argument, the National League East. Last week, we covered the toughest division in all of baseball, the American League East. Well, today, we'll cover the uh, second toughest division. And then next week, we'll conclude before the start of the regular season with our division, which is the weakest division in all of Major League Baseball. But, Matt, we'll get to that. Yeah. Um, I want to start with March Madness and the NCAA basketball tournament. But before I do, I have a pet peeve when it comes to college basketball. When I was your age and younger, Matt, I was the biggest college basketball fan. Um, I, I adored college basketball. I talked about it on the air, off the air, watched as many games as I possibly could. I felt guilty if I missed games when I was on the air the next day. I felt guilty if I didn't see a college game the night before. Now... I couldn't care less about the regular season. Mm. Uh, now I'm into the tournament. But here's why. Postseason conference tournaments have ruined the regular season of college basketball. Because what's the meaning of the regular season round robin? It used to determine who gets the automatic bid into the NCAA tournament. Winning your conference was a big thing, and especially before they expanded the tournament from 16 teams. The only way you'd get in when it was only 16 teams is to win your conference, and then there would be at-large bursts after the major conferences were determined. And even some of the minors got in, like a Wichita State made their mark back in the old 16-team format. But because of these postseason conference tournaments, in my opinion, the regular season has been tarnished greatly. What does it mean? And what do these postseason conference tournaments mean? Matt, before I bring you in on this, UConn this week, going into the NCAA tournament, is ranked number one in the country. Uh, they won the Big East. Okay. Postseason conference tournament I'm talking about. Let's just concentrate on the postseason conference tournaments. Houston, one and two and three, all season long, all season long, has been a fantastic team, and they lose the Big 12 to uh, Iowa State. Oh, not by a point or two, not in overtime. They get beat 69 to 41. Now, does that damage them? Of course not. They're a number one seed. They're, they're the number one seed in the South. So what was the meaning of that postseason conference tournament? Purdue loses to Wisconsin in the Big Ten. The, wh what does that mean? Nothing. They're still a number one seed. Uh, North Carolina loses to NC State. And North Carolina is still a number one seed. Tennessee uh, uh, it goes down SEC. Uh, they lose to Mississippi State. They're still a number two seed. I can go on and on and on. And these teams that win, I mean, what does it mean? And here's another point. 
it deprives teams that are more deserving to get in. If a team has a miraculous finish and wins a postseason, doesn't happen so much in the big conferences, but definitely it will occur in the horizons of the world. Matt, your take. Yeah, I mean, it's funny because you look at it, Bruce, you might not actually want to win your conference. That's extra games that you got to play, and somebody could get hurt. That's extra minutes. So if you bow out like Purdue did, not even in the championship, then you're like, all right, we get to sit down and sit at home, and we're still going to be a number one seed i agree i think it's gotten a little out of hand i think the tournament being it's as, for money we all know oh, it's yeah, because and, of money and the blow they're not going away no and the, the play-in games that i don't really think matter very much it's just it is all about the extra games and yeah th- it's almost like set in stone that they knew that these teams were going to be the number one seeds and at the end of the day i know teams do care about seeding but a lot of them look at it as as long as we're in the tournament, as long as you feel like you're a top three seed in whatever region you're in, you probably have a pretty good look. Now, we could play the game of, OK, did you want to stay on this top half of the bracket or stay away from this team? But a lot of these teams view it as, yeah, as long as we get in, you know, UConn picking the East like they did. Some people thought that was a little confusing because they thought, hey, that might be a tougher way to go because they get to pick which region that they go into. Um, I thought that was interesting. You know, you mentioned Houston, the stat on that. That was the least amount of points that an AP number one has ever put up in a game. As being ranked as the AP number one, which Houston was when they did that, nobody is 41. That was the lowest point total that any team had ever put up uh, with that. So, yeah, I mean, you look at it from this standpoint, they made it, they're in maybe less game or two. Um, but yeah, the, the conferences still matter for the Ivy League and the MAC and these yes. other schools that know that yes. they're only going to get one in. Uh, I think they need to take a look at that. I, I think they need to take a look at maybe giving more It'll automatic never change, birds. Matt, because no, of the money not. that it generates. No. Um, uh, when I was with the, the television network, uh, we we uh, the first few years we were the uh, the home for the MAC tournament. We televised the games and. Uh, and it was fun. I, they had me doing my show there, and I really enjoyed it thoroughly. Mm-hmm. And I, I'll tell you what I really enjoyed was the women's, because it was the first time I was exposed to the women's game, and I didn't realize how physical a game it is. The officials let them play, and, and they really elbow underneath. It's a phys- more, much more physical game than I thought watching on television. But th- the point is that... <clears throat> These, it's all for money. It generates money. It's not going away. And indeed, uh, you see these kids celebrating, cutting the nets out. And I'm thinking, you know, why? You know, what? 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 I, 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 I also th- say. I think the coaches have a, an extra burden to try to motivate their kids to win the postseason conference tournament. And do is it anticlimactic once the official tournament begins, the big tournament that counts, namely now, does that take away from teams who have won uh, the postseason conference tournament? Yeah, and you're talking about teams that are getting in like Michigan State. Bruce, I mean, Michigan State went 19-14. and 14. And I'm not saying the Big Ten wasn't good this year, but still, you have, t- and again, another uh, team, Nebraska, 23-10, and 10, Texas A&M, 20-14. and 14. And Then you've got other schools that have three losses that are a 12 seed. And I get it. The conferences are so different. Your strength of schedule, who you're playing uh, out of conference matters a lot. But it's it, it's what the con- it's what the committee wants. They'd rather take the seventh or eighth best team in a major conference over the second best team in a smaller conference because dollars, fans, all that. I get it. Well, uh, tomorrow, uh, the first and second rounds, uh, the first round gets underway. UConn is the number one seed. Um, and let's talk about that uh, bracket. That's the East. Um, I see Auburn as their biggest challenge in that upper bracket, Matt. Um, mm-hmm. I- I- anybody? Northwestern pulled off a couple upsets in the Big Ten yeah, this year, including, yeah. including one against Purdue. But I think, do, would you agree that Auburn is the only challenge there for UConn? On the upper half, for sure. The lower half, which I'm sure we'll talk about, I think there's another team I'm going to look at as well. But yeah, for that upper half, I do believe it'll be 1 4 there again. Well, obviously, 16. Iowa State is a noteworthy team. As a matter mm-hmm. of fact, going into the tournament, they were elevated three spots in the AP. They're now ranked number four in the country. And uh, in the lower bracket uh they drew south dakota state um and, and they should uh get uh, illinois who knows that's uh, i it, think illinois is the team i'm looking i can actually see illinois beating iowa state and meeting meeting uh yukon there in the elite eight be I do. careful yeah and, and here's why i'm gonna say that to you partner we're big 10 supporters mm-hmm we grew up in the Big Ten country. I want to see the big... Uh, there was a time 
when I would boast that, you know, they talked about the ACC, the ACC, the ACC. Back in the Bobby Knight era, the Big Ten was the best basketball conference in this country. Even when uh, Johnny Wooden had made uh, set all the records, the Pac-8 back then was UCLA and a bunch of others. Southern Cal would pull off an upset once in a while. But my point is that top to bottom, the Big Ten used to be, and I think confidently could boast, as the best basketball conference in the country. And they still have that ego about them. But do you realize it's been since Mateen Cleaves and Izzo won the Mm -hmm. national championship for Michigan State that the Big Ten has won? What an embarrassment, Matt. 2000, 24 years. I mean, that's how long it's been going. You're right. And now you think, okay, yeah, Purdue, number one seed. Bruce, who's the number one seed? Everybody thinks is going to be the first one to go home. It's Purdue after what they did last year. Is there a hangover And the year that? before, right? You know, you get Zach Eady into foul trouble. I, I, I don't I don't think anybody feels real confident in Purdue. I mean, yeah, sure, Sweet 16, Elite 8, maybe. But Final Four in a championship? I don't know many people that are picking Purdue. Uh, in the uh, West, uh, North Carolina's number one. And... And uh, um, obviously, they did what they had to do, and they beat Duke, um, their arch rivals, a couple of times during the regular season. Um, and I think the luster of that is a little bit off based on what we mentioned uh, earlier. But Arizona is another team. Uh, I-, I don't know how to figure them. They've been up and down. They lost the Pac-12 championship to Oregon, 67-59, and they actually dropped three spots in this week's rankings leading into the tourney. They're now ranked number nine going in. But I'm, I'm looking at that bracket. You know, Alabama's another team. How do you... How do you figure them, Matt? Uh, I I don't see anything else in there. Do you? No, and actually, Alabama-Charleston is one of my long-shot upset picks there. Charleston runs a pace that I don't know if Alabama, if they're not ready to go for that, they could get up on them quick there. So that's one of my upset specials for that one as well. You know, Baylor is a team that a lot of people are hyped on just based on recency bias on how well they've played. I know a lot of people that have Arizona coming out of that side of the bracket to go to the Final Four as well. So as we start to to match up, I do think... I think the West, for my money, is the most intriguing bracket. The, the side of the bracket where I think there's the most possibility that I could see. I'm still, my gut You goes, mean for a Cinderella? For a Cinderella or just, I feel really confident in UConn. You know, we'll get to the South and the Midwest in a second. The West, I could really talk myself into, uh, talk myself into about three different teams. I'm still going to go UNC to come out of there. That's still my pick to come out of there. Uh, but that's the one that I could see the most intrigue for you sure. You know what would really be funny? If St. Mary's, who's in the same conference, a as lot Gonzaga, of people like them. Yep, I know. Yep. A lot if of people like St. Mary's. The conference of Gonzaga. Yeah. If they made it and, and, and accomplished more than what Few has done yeah. with all these great teams that he's had over the years at Gonzaga. All right, let's move over to the South, where Houston is the number one seed. Uh, now, this is a very competitive uh, bracket, Matt, uh, because you've got Wisconsin and Duke um, looming. And if they win their first games, uh, then they would meet against one another uh, and inevitably have to play Houston, you would think. That's interesting. And and Wisconsin's a hard team to figure out. They had such a very good first portion of the season. Then they just went totally, totally south. And and then they kind of rejuvenated at the end of the Big Ten season and into the conference tournament. They're tough to figure out. Uh, Duke, of course, with uh, new coach John Shire uh, trying to find their footing. I don't know how good uh, they're, they are. Um, your take on that upper bracket of the South. Yeah, Duke is one. I, you know, you talk about Wisconsin. Those seem to be the team. I'm not a big believer in Houston. I, I just i am not. When I look at how I want to place my bets or where I'm making my picks, it's how did you finish your regular season? How are you? You playing your best basketball right now, and I just don't know if I can say that about the Cougars. So I'm I'm actually fading Houston a little bit. Um, I I could see Duke potentially taking them out in the Sweet 16 if that could be the matchup. But again, uh, that Wisconsin Duke matchup that we project to get in round two that might really tell the story. I think on how that upper bracket of the South is going to go. For historical purposes, the Houston Cougar fans are claiming that this is the best team Houston has had since. Um, 
they had Big E, Elvin Hayes, and uh, knocked off uh, UCLA with Lou L. Cinder when he was at UCLA under John Wooden in that historic game at the Astrodome. Uh, and then, of course, they uh, uh, had a rematch in the semifinals, and UCLA absolutely uh, killed them. As a matter of fact, I remember interviewing John Wooden, and he was in his 90s, and he was still sharp as a tack. And I brought that year up. And I said, you got upset. El Cinder had a patch over one eye when they played in the Astrodome. It was the largest crowd to see a basketball game, college or pro, to that point in history. And then they wound up meeting again in the semifinals of the NCAA tournament. And I said, Coach, you really got your revenge. You, you annihilated Houston in that semifinal game, beat them by about 30 he said, well, precisely, it was a 19-point victory. And <laughs> I mean, got sharp as a tack. But historically, Houston is saying this is their best team since then. Um, in the bottom portion of that south bracket, uh, again, you've got some very interesting uh, – uh, NC State and Houston uh, – or Kentucky, I should say, could be an interesting matchup if they win their first games, Matt. And then, of course, Marquette. And I don't know how to figure them, and I don't know how to figure Florida. I actually saw their game against South Carolina during the regular season when I was still recently in Florida. But then they turned around, and they lost that game. And then they turned around. They did very well in the SEC tournament. Yeah, I think I'll start with Kentucky. You know, we talked to our friends at Tipico, and Sonny Gupta told us that their biggest liability, as far as a lower seed that has the most money on, is number three seeded Kentucky. There's a lot of people that have Kentucky not not only coming out of that South, but potentially winning the national championship as a three. The other thing about Marquette is all, you know, with the tournament, there's all these different historical things where on average, Bruce, there is a 12, five upset every on average every year. So some years there's two, some years there's none, but one of the highest upset averages at one and a half per year is a five, 12 upset. So odds would tell you pick a five, a five 12. The other historical context that I'm grabbing is that one of the two seeds will not make it to the Sweet 16. Odds tell you almost every year at least one two seed will not make it to the Sweet 16. Marquette would probably be my pick in that one. You know, touche on that 5A, you know, uh, 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 that's a fascinating way to look at the tournament historically mm -hmm. since it expanded to this many teams. I've never really paid much attention to that, but um, interesting tidbits. Well, we didn't have a 16 upsetting uh, the number one. Right, and I, I'm, I'm on record on our show. Ryan knows this, that I've guaranteed that that will not happen again this year, so go ahead and parlay <laughs> that on up if you want because I think all four of the ones are going to advance but yeah i mean i think you look at the two seeds we'll get to tennessee coming up but marquette would probably be the pick and then the 512 i mean you've got like james madison they went 31 and 3 and they're taking on that wisconsin team bruce that you mentioned is struggling a little bit yeah in the midwest we'll get to mcneese state went 30 and 3 and they're taking on a gonzaga team that had seven loss i mean those are the kind of matchups that i think where yes You've got a smaller conference school, but they only lost three games all right. year, and they're right. playing this five. I think that five twelve. Pick one. I don't know if I quite like because here are your five twelve matchups. Again, you could go ahead if you really wanted to and take again Gonzaga McNeese State. You got Wisconsin James Madison. The other one is San Diego State UAB, which I don't really like that, and I don't like St. Mary's getting upset by Grand Canyon at all. So really, if you were gonna pick a five twelve upset. I think you're either taking the South, Wisconsin, James Madison, or the Midwest, which we'll get to with Gonzaga and McNeese. Let's get to that Midwest right now where Purdue is the number one seed. And in the upper portion of their bracket, um, Gonzaga is looming, and so is Kansas. Now, Kansas has been stricken by injuries. McCullers, I think, is out for the tournament. Yes. And uh, they've got other injuries as well. I think Bill Self, um, I, I, I've said for years, uh, can be categorized as definitely one of the best coaches, not only today in college basketball, but historically as well. And, and a perfect, not only because of what he has accomplished at Kansas, but let me refresh your memory again historically. The year that Illinois was undefeated, Ranked number one in the country. Bruce Weber was their coach. They lost right at the end of the regular season to the Buckeyes of Ohio State. Went into the Big Ten tournament, won the Big Ten tournament, went into the NCAA tournament, and 
coasted their way to the championship, and then got beat by Roy Williams and North Carolina substantially. Now, this was the Darren Williams, D.D. Brown team. I mentioned Bruce Weber was the coach. That was his first year as the coach of Illinois. Bill Self was the coach at Illinois and recruited all those kids that blossomed and excelled the first year that Self had left Illinois and went to Kansas. So in a way, you can say, well, Self actually made it to the Final Four and the championship game with another one of his teams, where, which he built, obviously, with the Fighting Illini of Illinois. But he's got his hands full this year, Matt, because of these injuries, and it showed going down the stretch with all the tough losses that they uh, experienced. I had somebody tell me Samford is their lock to cover. Not necessarily to win, but one of the covers there for, for the spread there with the Kansas game, which is an interesting one as well. You know, yeah, and then I'd look at Purdue. Are they still having that hangover from last year? Did they play their best <laughs> basketball? It's just, I mean, the problem is Bruce and I've said this that nobody means as much to their team in this tournament as Zach Eady does to Purdue so if you can get him into foul trouble oh. if you make it a physical game and get after him what happens to Purdue I don't really know so I do like Kansas getting past Samford maybe to cover um, and then at that point you're right Gonzaga I kind of said it might be my upset special there for your 5-12 not a big believer in either Utah State or TCU so Purdue might have that easy path to the uh, to the Elite Eight but once you get to that bottom part of that Midwest, Bruce, this might be, for my money, one of the tougher sections of the entire bracket. Yeah, I, uh, um, I, I, I just can't, I can't phantom the criticism that not only Purdue is going to get, but the Big Ten if they get upset again. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I mean, it, it's amazing. And you make a great point about foul trouble. If Edie gets in foul trouble, which very, very easily could be the case, it, it, it depends about it depends the officiating crew if they're calling them tight and it, 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 the coaching is is smart against Purdue um, and they go after him um, and he gets physical and gets in foul trouble oh brother I I don't even want to go there bottom portion of that bracket obviously um, uh, the Akron team representing the Mac uh, has a tough assignment I'm going to get to that in a minute uh, Tennessee is the team to beat there's no question about it what a tremendous season they've had in the Southeastern Conference but let me say something about Creighton a couple of weeks ago Matt, we had young uh, Tanner Castora on the show, who, um, as young as he is, and I think Ryan will attest to this, um, he proved it was Ryan's first exposure to Tanner. I consider him one of the top college basketball experts in the country. He really is. a. I mean, he knows every player on every team, every coach, every record, uh, with the kind of offense they run, kind of defense they play. And he brought to our attention – how experienced, how good and talented and big Creighton is. Now, Creighton is a three seed going up against the Zips. But then again, I get back to my original point that I brought up, Matt, about these postseason conference tournaments. They get beat by Providence, 69-67. to 67. Not that, uh, you know, they're going to uh, – that will carry over into the NCAAs because they could have been just looking ahead. Again, what is the point of these postseason conference tournaments? But watch out for Creighton. Yeah, I like Creighton down there. I still have Tennessee, so I think that would be a fantastic matchup for those guys if they got to the Sweet 16 for the chance to go. Um, I like Tennessee to come out of there, but I, that South Carolina-Oregon matchup is a really interesting one because I have some people that believe that South Carolina can make it all the way to the Elite Eight, potentially. That would mean an upset of Creighton in the second round if it went that way, so... Uh, that is why I say, like, we're again, I've got people that are high on Oregon. That's a great first round matchup with South Carolina and Oregon. You mix in Creighton, you mix in Tennessee. That's one, Bruce, where I try just in that little small section. I talk myself into three or four teams coming out of that uh, for the right to go to the Elite Eight. Do you have a pick uh, this early? I do. I just got to go with UConn. I do. I think it's going to be they're They're motivated. I think they are the best team. Some of the advanced metrics. So the Ken Palm rating that everybody talks about every single net. So the Ken Palm rating is an efficiency rating that you look at for some of these different teams. And so since the Ken Palm rating started, Bruce, all the way back in 2002, every single national champion has finished in the top 25 in offense and defensive rating 
in the Ken Palm ratings. There are eight teams that qualify for that this year. UConn, Arizona, Auburn, Creighton, Houston, Marquette, UNC, and Purdue. So if you were looking at that, and again, every national champion for the last 22 years prior to this has fit into this metric, that would tell you your national champion probably coming from one of those eight teams. That's fascinating. Mm-hmm. I also like UConn, ironically. Yeah, I do too. Um, I, I kind of uh, make the analogy to the KC Chiefs. They're the defending champions until you prove to me you can dethrone them. I got to go back with them. And the way they played in the tournament a year ago, I mean, they weren't even, nobody was even close to them last year in the tournament. So I totally agree. We'll see. It starts in earnest tomorrow. A couple of play, more playing games tonight. Boise State and Colorado and Montana State and Grambling. Who cares? All right. Let, let me, uh, uh, before we go to break, I want to shift to the Browns because since I was on the air last week here with Ryan, Matt, um, the Browns have signed Jameis Winston as the backup um, to uh, Deshaun Watson. And Tyler Huntley uh, used to be with the Ravens. Um, your take on that? I mean, I think Winston's a good sign for a yeah. backup. Yeah, and I think the tough thing was there was an emotional attachment to Joe Flacco, but I didn't feel like he fit, and they probably felt like what happened last year was lightning in a bottle. Whether we subscribe to the distraction factor with Watson, and if they didn't want to do that, if they wanted to just nip that in the bud and say, we're not even going to worry about Watson looking over his shoulder, he feels more comfortable with Jameis Winston. If that's what happened, that's what happened. I know people are upset by it, but Bruce, I think a lot of people, I'm not saying you, but just I know a lot of people, they're missing the point. The backup shouldn't have to play. In a real world, and I know Watson is coming off injury, and there's that factor, but we shouldn't see Jameis Winston play. We shouldn't have to see Dorian Thompson Robinson play. This year is all about getting Deshaun Watson to find out, is he your guy or not? And if they think there would be any detriment, any little detriment of having Joe Flacco here to impact that negatively, then they made the move they did. And with Winston here, I think, again, a serviceable, solid backup, sure. Uh, okay, he turns the football over. Yeah, that's why he's not a starter anymore. That's why he's here on backup money and hopefully doesn't have to play. Um, I just think the Browns made that move uh, to just, again, further signify they're all in on Deshaun Watson. Yeah, and uh, as they should be uh, with that kind of money and uh, that kind of a commitment. But um, I, I've been saying this on the show the last few weeks since the end of the season, and I cannot emphasize it enough, Matt. Watson merely doesn't have the pressure of equaling what Flacco did from a season ago when he took over. He must exceed the accomplishment of Flacco with the Browns. Because as I say, the clock is ticking. This is the third year now we're entering of the five-year contract. I have said from the get-go that I support this move by the Haslams making this trade. But if we don't get to the Super Bowl within this five-year contract, and I'm not even saying winning it, I'll be happy if we just get there. Browns are one of only four teams in the NFL that have never been there. Let's just get there. If we don't get there within the five-year contract with everything we gave up, I believe it will set the franchise back an additional five years, at least an additional five years, because the offensive line will be gone, Chubb will be gone, the receivers will be gone, I think at least five more years. So it's vital that this year, in my opinion, Watson must exceed what Flacco did to not only get into the playoffs, but win a game. I'm not saying get to the Super Bowl necessarily this year, but to at least advance further. I mean, this they shouldn't have lost to Houston. They shouldn't have lost to Houston, but they did. Okay, they still got their feet wet. Maybe it'll be a good thing if they get in next year and they remember the taste of that defeat, but Watson must exceed what Flacco did. He has to, and I think it's also when you factor the money, the the picks, and just knowing the Browns' easiest path to that, Bruce, is Deshaun Watson playing well. And if it's not, then we're going to have a lot of bigger problems on what you do, who you're bringing in, how you're allocating your money. But the easiest path for the Browns to be successful is for Deshaun Watson to turn things around. They've done everything this offseason, in my opinion, with that in mind. 
Got him another receiver. Change of the offensive staff a little bit. Maybe a change in the scheme. Got him backup quarterbacks that fit better. It's all on him. He's got to prove that he can be the guy. And I know he's coming off shoulder surgery, and I know this week he reportedly was going to start throwing. There's that whole factor, too. Um, but you're right. He the, These benchmarks are here. There's no more uh, waiting around to see. There's no more dealing with a suspension or dealing. And if he gets hurt, I don't know what to tell you, Bruce, because if he gets hurt, oh, I, I'm just chalking oh. this up as it's time to oh, move on. Oh, it's oh. time to go. Well, uh, it, the other factor, if we don't make the playoffs, heaven forbid, and there's no guarantee that the Browns will, especially now that the Steelers have gone out and gotten uh, Russell Wilson and Justin Fields as their backup. But um, Burrow's going to be healthy next year. Look out there. And obviously, um, if I'm the Ravens and Harbaugh, they've gonna, they're going to have such a big chip on their shoulders following that loss at home to Kansas City. I mean, I can't even imagine. So there's no guarantee. But if we don't make the playoffs next year, with the Browns bringing in Vrabel, do you agree that Stefanski's out and Vrabel's in? I don't. I think it's Stefanski is the one that he'll get this contract extension. I, I think he. You got to build around somebody, right? When you pivot your franchise, there's somebody. There's usually players you have to build around. If Watson I, stays healthy the whole year and they don't make the playoffs, and Stefanski still play calling, and uh, there's criticism of him, you still think he I stays? Do. I do. I think he stays. I think at this point, you, the proof is that he's had success with a lot of different quarterbacks, and. Again, I just hate to pile it on and say maybe he just wasn't going to be successful with Deshaun Watson. That's a Deshaun Watson problem. And the play calling is also is always chicken the egg, right? Stefanski's an offensive coach, man. I know, but if it's that Watson is not executed, the plays could be drawn up perfectly, and there could be a guy wide open, and Watson doesn't see him, or Watson escapes when he really shouldn't. I can't blame Stefanski for that. And you're right. You, the job of them and the job of Ken Dorsey is to get Deshaun Watson up to speed and back to where he's at. I, I got to tell you, Bruce, I think and I, I do think a part of it is how volatile Deshaun Watson is for some yeah. of the fans here where he would be the one to go, not Kevin Stefanski. Well, where's he going to go? I don't know. I mean, that's the other problem. Nobody's going to take that kind. No. If he underachieves next year, who's going to want that kind? Well, that's the thing. You're just going to have to eat that money and cut him. At that point, you're just going to talk about a record cap hit, a rec record dead cap hit swallow your pride, have to eat up this deal for a couple of years. I think that's part of the reason they haven't restructured him yet. They want to start eating some of this money up now to leave the door open if they got to get out of this. It's a bad situation. It, it is. But Maybe I think Wilson will underachieve at Pittsburgh and we can bring him in there. Yeah, I want a Justin chance. Fields. I, I did. I want a Justin Fields here, but that didn't happen. So I get it. I, I do think I, I think Stefanski would survive now beyond a year beyond. I don't know. You know, 2026 beyond. I don't know. Uh, beyond that, I think he would survive, though. Even if Watson was bad. The fans and certainly my man Ryan over here have heard me say this time and time again, and now I'll say it to you, partner. The clock is ticking. The clock is ticking. Bruce Drennan, Matt Fontana, Ryan Smith. It's bonus time with Drennan on the Big Play Sports Network. We'll resume in a minute. Love you, Cleveland. Love you, Ohio. Bruce Drennan here. Dr uh, bonus time with Drennan. And uh, we are uh, proceeding here with our show, uh, this week's uh, version, uh, here on the Big Play Sports Network. Matt Fontana of the Matt Fontana Show here on the Big Play Sports Network. Kind enough to join us this week, uh, holding Matt over for another segment. Uh, don't forget, now in the third and final segment, I'll be predicting the National League East, and it's the Ask Bruce segment, so we will be fielding your questions. Um, Cavaliers, I want to uh, address two topics in this segment, Matt, the Cavaliers and the Guardians in the upcoming baseball season. Um, Cavaliers, it, I think it has shown with these games that Mitchell has missed how vitally important he is to the team. And let me start by saying this. His presence is not only uh, uh, missed – because of his point production, but I think it puts too much pressure on Garland, your mm -hmm. take. I've been really kind of underwhelmed with Darius Garland during the stretch. I wanted him to take the reins over and, and step up and be the player, and they've won some games. They've lost some games. I understand that Darius Garland's not to the level of Donovan Mitchell. It's just some late-game things, Bruce, that I can't help it. I feel negative for feeling this way. I don't want to feel this way. I, I just I, I just question Darius Garland, and, and, and maybe it's unfair, but you're right. It's got to be Donovan Mitchell. I'm now to the point of understanding, as we've known, the Cavs have to make a move. They can't keep these four guys around here, especially with the deals that got to get handed out. If Mitchell returns, 
I think that's the end of Darius Garland here. This just has to be. Jared Allen has proven that he is invaluable to this team. You can't get rid of him. And they're not going to give up on Evan Mobley for the prospect that he is. Garland might find himself as the odd man out in that group. And it sucks because we all believe that he was going to be a part of the future here. And you just shift everything when you get a guy like Donovan Mitchell. And it's changed a lot of things. Uh, I don't like the way that I feel the way I do about Darius Garland. Um, it's just some of the games that I've seen, Bruce. I want I want him to go off for 35 and lead the team to a, a, a win and will them to a win. I just don't know if I see it. In games where I see guys like Karis LeVert have to step up yeah. to get a win and Jared yeah. Allen's got to step up. I want that to be Darius Garland. And it just really hasn't been. You think that the Cavaliers are physical enough this year as opposed to last year when it was obviously physicality was the difference in the series against New York. Do you think they're physical enough this year, even though it seems like it's a deeper bench with all these various guys at different portions of this season stepping up and being the hero? I mean, I think it's funny you mention that because they bring in Tristan Thompson for that. They signed Marcus Morris, this 10 day contract. One guy can't change the whole team, though. You can't. And I think Max Struess has brought in a level of toughness to this team. But, Bruce, what happened? Everybody got hurt. Are they playing? Are they trying to play a physical brand of basketball and it's causing all these injuries? I don't know. I mean, it's just to, to see the gauntlet that they've had to run through knowing that toughness was their biggest knock. Now, now it's nice to show a little bit. I need it in the first round of the playoffs. I don't need it till for another month plus when we get to the playoffs. And it's not as simple as saying, all right, today we're going to be tough or today we're going to show up. It is telling your your opponent knowing that before they even start the game. I don't know, Bruce. I don't think they've really shown a lot. And really, I think the biggest one that everybody was looking at was Jared Allen. And I don't know if much has changed with him. I know, Grant, he's playing amazing. He's playing awesome. I'm happy with his play. But Jared Allen was the one that everybody kept calling soft last year. And I don't know if I see that big of a change. Yeah, to be honest so with him. you have concerns about that. I do. Yeah, I still do. Yeah, I still do. And especially, again, depending on how important this stretch is going to be, who you're playing, who Milwaukee is playing, can you stay in that two seed? Yeah. I mean, this is just. Uh, what did you make seeding. of the coaching change by Milwaukee in midseason? I mean, I think it's just. When you have star players and you have expectations, they can't fire the players. So they had to fire him. And now, Doc. I guess people want to buy into, yes, it took him a little bit to get it turned around, but now that he has, uh, they seem to be in the right direction. But now Giannis is out. You know, if you're gonna, if you're watching this on Wednesday, you have what should be a marquee game in the East. Celtics, Bucks, Giannis isn't playing. Got a hamstring injury. Yeah. He's out. Yeah. So I think they took a little while for them to get their footing. They're probably better off with Doc Rivers. I'm not a big Doc Rivers fan. I don't think he's very good because, again, what's his knock? Playoffs. He doesn't get it done. Um, so we'll remain to be seen on that, but uh, they had to do something because it was just trending in the wrong direction. Well, still quite a few games left for the Cavaliers before we get ready for the postseason, and hopefully they can get healthy. What is the latest on Mobley anyway? Do we have an injury update on him? He supposedly this week is starting to do on the court. He and Struess are both supposedly on the court. I think I saw her. I mean, they were in – uh, Indiana, they went on that trip at least. So it seems like maybe they did shoot around or maybe they're starting to do some on court stuff. So I would hope that we're sooner rather than later for both Mobley and Struce. At least they're starting to do something. Now Mitchell had a procedure on that nasal fracture that he suffered. So I think it sounds like he's going to be out a week. Well, the baseball season is upon us, as we reported earlier. Uh, the uh, Los Angeles Dodgers and San Diego Padres opened things up in Seoul, South Korea today. The Dodgers wound up winning that game 5-2. to two. They'll play another one tomorrow. And uh, the Guardians will be opening up before you know it, and uh, it'll be Shane Bieber, who's looked tremendous in spring training. So far, so good with McKenzie. The starting rotation, except for Gavin Williams, seems to be intact. Got young Do uh, uh, Logan Allen and Bybee and Carlos Carrasco, a good um, safety uh, valve, if you will, because of the injury to Williams. Maybe he won't be ready for the start of the season, so Carrasco can slide in there. Uh, I, I love the bullpen, but it's bad news about Stefan, Matt. Um, the pitching, you know, <clears throat> as far as the starting rotation, let alone the bullpen, name me a team, and you can, but it's rare, that finishes the season with the same five-man rotation that they break camp with and head north. I I don't know if I could ever do that for you. I mean, you you miss guys. You lose guys left and right. Pitching and baseball, everybody's getting Tommy John. Everybody's got elbow and shoulder problems. And, yeah, it's cropped up at a bad time because, again, you mentioned Trevor Steffen. Sam Henches has this finger injury. Karen checks still with the shoulder. And then I was reading, too, Paul Hoynes had this on Cleveland.com, that apparently a virus went through the clubhouse, and they had some guys miss some workouts and some time. So, like, Xavion Curry is not going to be stretched out enough to be a factor for the 
rotation. Now he'll start in the bullpen. Then you have this uh, younger guy, Tyler Beatty. Then you still have Carrasco. Whoever doesn't get that fifth spot, they'll probably go to the bullpen. Um, there's a lot of questions with it. And yeah, that bullpen last year was Emmanuel Classe, and that's about it. I need a little more out of Eli Morgan right. this year. Um, I thought there were times that he was so good. Other times he kind of gave it up. That's the life of a bullpen guy. I understand that. You know, but the rotation, I, I think you're solid in your first four. Uh, and yeah. I'm excited to see McKenzie yeah. back out and, there. And, and Carrasco's a good pickup. Yeah, I love Car. I love Navarro. Been back. there, I do. done yeah. that until yeah. Williams gets healthy. I'll tell you the guy that probably will step up, and it will. Might, I, I'm hoping it turns out to be a good offseason acquisition, especially because of this bad news about Stefan, is uh, Scott Barlow. Scott Barlow, yeah. I like that pickup a yeah. lot. Yeah, yeah. I do. Um, offensively, um, uh, Moncardo, I, I, I think it's no hidden, uh, it's no big surprise that he was sent down. Uh, he could play every day. Uh, he wouldn't be doing that up here. Uh, they've got the Rule 5 uh, stipulation with De Los Santos, so they had to keep him on the roster. Um, it, it, this uh, De La Otter has just been fantastic in spring training. I'll tell you a guy who I think needs to step up, and I believe he will to help this offense that so desperately needs a, a boost to score runs, is uh, Josh's brother, uh, Bo Naylor. Mm. I'm, I'm looking for um, a much better season out of him now that he's got his feet wet. Yeah, and uh, bringing Austin Hedges back to help him out with that, I think, is going to be massive. You know, Manzardo going down, you're right. And then DeLauder, Bruce, I, 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 I don't know how you feel about it. They have to send him down. They're going to. They're going to send. He's going to start the season at double A. That's what the sources had said. And I know he made it really tough, but he's only played five games above high A. You you yeah. can't yeah you just can't throw and him they in got there. this Florial too that they right that's not Florial who whether whatever Miles Straw and then you still have Tyler Freeman you still have some other guys you can plug I in there. I mentioned the clock is ticking. It's ticking on Straw too. Yeah, I mean I think it's a, it, it's such a it, it is such an inequity that he was not in the final three for the Gold Glove um, last year because he's definitely one of the top defensive center fielders in all of Major League Baseball. Mm -hmm. But I mean you got to be able to hit, man. This yeah. is the major leagues. Yeah, and that's why. I like like DeLauder, I'd send him down just because you have some guys for right now. Now, midseason, I think he will come back up eventually. He could have a quick trip through double A AA and triple A and bring him back up. So I know there's excitement there. I'm watching Brian Rocchio a lot too. Gabriel yes. Arias. I mean, that yes. it sounds like they're going to give Rocchio that first crack, yes. but Arias better start proving some things here. I mean, yes. there's just there's only so many at bats, there's only so many positions. And I think for Steven Vogt, his first time going through this. I don't want him doing that. I want him to know, hey, you know, okay, some positions, Steven Kwan's your leadoff, and he's going to be left every day that he can be. Jose Ramirez, I would bat him third, but that's just me. Playing me third, me all too. good, you know, whatever. The other positions, they are battles for right now. I want to get them figured out by May. I'd yeah. love to get it figured out by middle of May to say, yep, it is Brian Rocchio or Gabriel Arias there. Yep, this is exactly who our first baseman or who our right fielder is going to be. I just think that helps Steven vote in his first year. So, again, I'm fine with the position battles for right now, but I need to get those kind of figured out pretty Well, quick. the beauty is that it's the weakest division in all of baseball. Correct, and, yeah. And it's a very winnable division, obviously. Uh, Minnesota lost Mejeda, and they lost Sonny Gray. Um, Buxton is still uh, very injury-prone. Even Royce Lewis is injury-prone. I don't know what's going on on the south side of Chicago. Uh, Kansas City. Oh, there's City stuff going on, Bruce. They're just getting rid of everybody <laughs> is what they're doing. That's what they're doing. There's some, these long rebuilds, it's, I'm, you know, you bring it up where I get where the Royals are at. They're all in on Bobby Witt, and I, I would know. be too, and they sign it. I but still don't just, see it, man. I still don't see that. And that's the thing, Bruce. It's these long five to six year rebuilds yeah. that still don't pan out. Yeah. Say what you I want about the picture. Guardians and their front office, but at least consistently they're I, there. I, They've avoided, like the Tigers have been rebuilding for Five and years. I think the Tigers are ahead of the Royals. I, I really agree. do. And there's because still... I like their pitching more with Scooble and Mize and Manning, and I like their pitching more than I do uh, uh, it, 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 the the Royals. But we shall see. Uh, the good news for the Guardians is it's a winnable division, and indeed it's there for uh, the taking. And the biggest thing, the biggest emphasis I've made is that it was vital with a rookie manager that they keep Carl Willis as a pitching coach standing right alongside vote. Once those starters leave the game and you got to manipulate that bullpen because Willis is one of the best. Matt, it's been a delight as oh, always, yeah. my friend. We must do this. You. We must do this again and uh, hopefully often, pal. Absolutely. Always here for Bruce. Really appreciate it. Matt Fontana of the Matt Fontana Show here on the Big Play Sports Network. When we get back, I'm going to predict the National League East. It's the Ask Bruce segment. 
I got a little bit of golf for you, too. That's next on Bonus Time with Drennan. Once again, our thanks to uh, my partner and colleague, uh, Matt Fontana of the Matt Fontana Show here on the Big Play Sports Network, joining us first two segments of Bonus Time with Drennan this week. And it's time for our second-to-last division divisional prediction show. And today, um, I will predict the second, preview the second toughest division in all of baseball. Last week, we did the American League East. I think it's a general consensus. That's the toughest. The National League East is the second toughest. Washington Nationals are probably still two years away from serious contention or avoiding being a seller dweller. Uh, They got a breakout campaign from Lane Thomas. Nice looking ball player, Lane Thomas is, no question. Growth on the part uh, uh, of uh, C.J. Abrams, um, Josiah Gray, Mackenzie Gore, the addition of a blue chip prospect in Dylan Cruz. Uh, as far as Abrams is concerned, he's got a lot of speed, um, might have to uh, move over to shortstop depending on uh, the other roster moves. Uh, Nick Senzel at third base is an interesting prospect because he was a star in college, but he, he still has to adjust to fastballs in the on the major league level. Victor Robles has been in Washington for several years now, going back to their championship season. He's a great fielder, but he's been an underachiever as a hitter um, in the big leagues. And, of course, uh, Lane Thomas himself, not only did he come alive with his bat, but certainly he is a Golden Glove defensive outfielder. Now let's talk about the New York Mets. And the Mets finished 75-87 and a year ago. Their head of baseball operations is David Stearns. Their owner, of course, is Steve Cohen. They spend money like crazy. Uh, Their payroll is $343 million. Their attendance is 2.5 million. For New York standards, that's below par. There's no question about it. And what this proves is that money can't buy you success. Just because it helps, there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. It helps, but it doesn't guarantee success in any way or form. Steve Cohen, the owner, has splashed hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars in free agency, including Justin Verlander and top Japanese import pitcher Kodai Senga. Instead, the most expensive team ever built, they were a flop. 9-17 and 17 the month of June. It sank both New York's title hopes and its season, with the team choosing to sell at the deadline, dealing. Verlander, Max Scherzer, and other veterans. While the Braves ran away with the East, the Mets finished a distant fourth with their third below 500 record in their last four years. So, so much for spending all that money. New president of baseball operations, David Stearns, who I mentioned earlier, formerly of the Milwaukee Brewers. New York barely took part in free agency and failed to land Japanese star Yamamoto and otherwise steering clear of the top tier available players. Pete Alonso still a star at first base. He'll produce offensively 40 plus home runs. Jeff McNeil at second, a career 298 hitter. Very, very good. Francisco Lindor, our old pal at shortstop, coming off his first 30 30 season. And the swish hitter, still a very viable cog in that offense. Um, Senga hurt again to start the season. Jose Quintana, are you kidding me? Give me a break. He's won only 15 games in his last four seasons, and he's slated to be their number two starter. That tells you what a sad way uh, that they're, they are in. And Luis Severino, who was across town in the Bronx with the Yankees, now comes to the Mets. One-year gamble on the upside of a power arm. Um, Edwin uh, Diaz is a uh, uh, top-rated closer, but the Mets, again, you can't expect them in this division to do much of anything. And then there's the Miami Marlins. What a team they are. Dangerous young ball club, which they proved a year ago. 84-78 and record, but what a postseason. They made it. They were tough. Skip Schumacher was the manager. Uh, Peter Bendix, the president of baseball operations. Only a payroll of $105 million and an attendance of barely over 
over a million. But, boy, they were an interesting team to watch. Their roster has guaranteed contracts for 2024 and beyond, so they're a team of promise, no question about it. Top prospect Yuri Perez sits at 98 miles per hour. He's hurt right now in spring training. Um, Jesus Lazardo, another great uh, uh, potential pitcher, uh, four-seam fastball at 96, 97 miles per hour. Former Guardian and Indian Josh Bell has produced a, a zero-war score for three teams since 2022, so he's on the downswing from his days, certainly, with Pittsburgh. Luis Ariz, who came over in that big deal for Pablo Lopez with the Minnesota Twins, career 326 hitter, should again vie for the National League banning crown. Jake Berger, a third, acquired last summer from the White Sox and Jazz. Chisholm is a nice-looking ball player. Exciting. Derailed last year by a toe injury. He is healthy this year and will be playing center field. Braxton Garrett also hurt right now, but he's got a good cutter, swing and miss slider, left-hander as well. That brings us to the Philadelphia Phillies. They have two-way starting pitchers in Nola and Wheeler. They have one of the best uh, uh, lineups and potential and, and potent lineups in all of baseball. And they have shown that they can beat the Atlanta Braves in the postseason, which, of course, is uh, um, having their number a big, big thing. They were 90 and 72 a year ago under Rob Thompson, and their payroll was $245 million. Their attendance over $3 million. They can afford to pay these players. And for the second straight year, the Phillies almost pulled it off. In 2022, they upended to the powerhouse Braves en route to a surprising World Series run. In 23, they again upended the powerhouse Braves en route to what looked like another World Series appearance, only to be um, dethroned by the Arizona Diamondbacks, a Cinderella story of the National League postseason a year ago. There are a few rosters as stacked with talent, particularly of MVP caliber players like Philadelphia, which returns the bulk of their 2023 squad for another bite at the apple. Uh, Dombrowski, the team's president, and the baseball operations moved quickly to keep Nola, the team's biggest free agent, in the fold while cost was eye-watering $172 million over the next seven years. Hello, he better produce. The lineup is one of the best in the major leagues. Bryce Harper and, of course, Zach Wheeler and Nola are a formidable one-two punch atop the rotation. Bullpen has depth and piles up strikeouts galore. And uh, the clock is ticking, though. Wheeler, a free agent after the season. Nola, Harper. Trey Turner, JT Real Muto, Kyle Schwarber, and Nick uh, Castellanos all are 30 years old or older. Harper, Tommy John surgery last year has found a new position for himself at first base. Trey Turner at short. Also, Chase pitches too often last year, but an elite base runner defense in decline. Alec Baum, power bat at third. Brandon Marsh, solid player coming into his prime out there in left field. Castellanos I mentioned in right. JT Rio Muto, still one of the best hitting catchers in all of baseball, and Kyle Schwarber with 49 home runs a year ago and 126 walks. Watch out for Philadelphia again this year. And that brings us to the Atlanta Braves. They have arguably the best rotation in all of baseball. Arguably the best one through nine lineup in all of baseball. Arguably the best player in Acuna. But they got to prove that they can beat Philadelphia in the postseason, do they not? A year ago, 104 and 58 was their record. Their payroll is 206 million, not as high as some of the other powerhouse teams in the major leagues. Their attendance, 3.1 million. They support them down in Atlanta. But in 2022, 100-plus wins in the National League East title, only to be upset by the Phillies again. 23, the Braves all again steamrolled the opposition and route to this fabulous season, only to be dethroned by the Philadelphia Phillies. So few, if any, teams are better have a lineup led by, of course, Acuna. Just absolutely brilliant talent. And they uh, picked up Jared Kelenic from the Seattle Mariners as a depth in the outfield. Their rotation with Spencer Strider had been had a down year, but by lofty standards, he said in 2022, but he is still led the majors in strikeouts and strikeout rate a year ago. Uh, Max Freed missed most of last season with a forearm strain, but when healthy, he's one of the best starting pitchers in the business. Um, their tandem of catching is perhaps the best in the big leagues with Sean Murphy, who they brought over as a free agent from Oakland. 
the Guardians tried to get him. Travis Denard, uh, best catching combination, I think, in all of baseball. Uh, Matt Olson at first base, rated as the best fastball hitter in the majors last season. Big power guy. Albies at second, switch hitter. Riley at third, just tremendous statistics at third base every single year. Harris is underrated and could come into his own this year in center. Acuna, best all-around player in all of baseball, monster hitter, uh, just a tremendous, tremendous talent, hitting 40-plus home runs each year, just amazing. And Azuna coming off his best season since 2020. Besides Strider and Freed, Charlie Morton, Chris Sale brought in during the offseason. They're so loaded, it's scary. The Atlanta Braves, my pick again to win the National League East, second toughest division in all of baseball, Ryan. Yeah, I agree with you, Bruce. I think many people would obviously go ahead and pick the Braves there. And I know we talk about, you know, the expectations that the Dodgers have this year. And it's it, it's it's hard to place, you know, a World Series as the basement expectation for a team. But obviously we know what the Dodgers did this offseason with Yamamoto and Shoya Otani. But obviously the Braves are right there too. You know, uh, they have a World Series win within the last five years. And they've just proven again, again, they're reload, reload, reload. And I think one through nine, I know it's a probably common consensus. I think they have the best lineup in baseball. All right, we're uh, to the Ask Bruce segment. Fire away, partner. All righty. Well, this one comes from our guy, Andy, who loves giving us a question every week. He says, welcome back to Ohio, Bruce. How would you compare your experiences as a Cubs fan throughout your childhood to then rooting for and covering the Browns when coming to Cleveland? <laughs> Again, I'm not surprised Andy asks a, a great question. I was anticipating him saying the Guardians or the Indians, and then he says the Browns because of the frustration suffered by the fans. Um, a few years ago in 2016 when the Indians played the Cubs in the World Series, a lot of people – knowing that I'm originally from Chicago, asked me, well, did you have mixed emotions? I said, no, not at all. I said I was ready, willing, and able to relocate anywhere in the country with my broadcasting career when I left Chicago to come here to Cleveland in the spring of 1978. And when I was 19 years old in 1969, the Cubs were running away with the Eastern Division. And Ron Santo, their third baseman, after every win, would jump up in the air and clamp his feet. And it was a celebration after every game because they had been so bad for so many years, even though in 67 and 68 they had decent seasons, but the Cardinals were so dominant both those years. And then they choked. And the Miracle Mets came out of nowhere and actually wound up winning the division by like 10 games after the Cubs had like almost a 10-game lead going into the month of August. Total choke. And it broke my heart, and they lost me. And then with my broadcasting career looming, and I was in college majoring in radio and TV, the Cubs were the last thing from that. They disappointed me and broke my heart so badly that it was the last thing on my mind was the Cubs. So then when I came to Cleveland, let alone getting the Indians TV job with Joe Tate to do uh, the play-by-play -play in color with Joe, um, you know, how do I, you know, I'm not, I've long since been a Cubs fan. But I will say this, to my grave, I will always have a love affair with Wrigley Field. To me, it's the best venue in all of sports. It's so homey and cozy and just the most fabulous place to relax and watch a game, and you're right on top of the field. So that I would say. But as far as the analogy between the frustration of the Cubs and the Browns, um, the only way I can answer that, Andy, and you've heard me say it again, is I think that Browns fans are the greatest fans of any team in any sport because they've been disappointed and – so deflated and so just devastated year after year after year, frustrated year after year after year, yet they're the most loving, adoring fans of their team, of any team I can think of in all of sports. Great question. All righty. Well, this one is fitting given that we talked about Miles Straw a little bit earlier. He said, Bruce, if you were the manager of the Guardians, how big of a leash would you give Miles Straw? Very short. Very short. What can I say about it's the big leagues? I thought two seasons ago, from August to the end of the year, he was hitting the ball more on the line than I'd ever seen him. I thought, hey, maybe 
going into 23. This was the end of 22. So maybe going it, but then again, another disappointment. They can't keep, and here's the problem. You could hide a bat like that in the outfield if you had power in your corner outfield positions, but you don't. Quan is a leadoff singles and doubles hitter. He's like a Suzuki type. He doesn't hit the long ball. And we have not gotten consistent power far from it. And right, I thought maybe we'd have it with Gonzalez, who's now with the Yankees. But we haven't gotten that out of Brennan or Loriano now that he's here or anybody else. You can't put three outfielders out there that don't have any power at all and Straw's the weakest of the bunch, and let alone he doesn't have the high batting average. Very short leash. Brennan can play center field. Very short. Bruce, what? Sorry, let me pull it up. Love clicking the wrong button and it disappears. Love that. Take your time. Bruce, do you do you see Shane Bieber having an actual chance to survive the trade deadline, or do you think the writing's on the wall? I think that depends on where we're at in the standings. If we're in contention, you don't dare trade him. You need that presence going down the stretch and certainly in the postseason if indeed we do qualify. And the division is winnable because it's such a weak division. Weakest in baseball. National League Central is the second weakest. No, but no comparison. This is the weakest division in all of baseball. It's very winnable for the Guardians because we have this good pitching. And if we can get a little more run production, play good, solid defense behind these pitchers, very winnable division. So you don't dare trade him if we're in contention at the deadline. You bite the bullet and you play it out the rest of the season. Because if we do get into the postseason, we got to have him. We can't advance in the postseason with these kids in that rotation without a veteran presence like him. Already, last one, Bruce. Can you build your perfect Guardian slash Indians lineup? They want you to put one player for each position, any era that you want to build what you think would be the greatest Guardians team of all time. <laughs> well, I think you got to say Sandy Alomar. This is off the top of my head. I should have more time to be able to. <laughs> yeah, that this. is very fair. My goodness gracious! But I think you have to say Sandy Alomar. I'll say Jim Tomey. Um, I'll say Roberto Alomar at second base. I think it's a debated short between, um, well, you actually have three guys. You've got Lou Boudreau, Omar Vizquel, and Francisco Lindor. That's a debate. Third base, I'll go with Jose all the way. I mean, I, re I really will. How do you not go with Jose? Uh, the outfield, um, Bell without question in left field. Uh, in center field, uh, I think you've got to go Kenny Lofton. That just goes to show you that 95 lineup was just so incredible. And how do you go against Manny Ramirez and Wright, even though Rocky Calavito with some of the old, old timers, but they're dying off real fast. Oh, God help me. Anyway, uh, uh, off the top of my head. Um, but pitching would be interesting, too, because Kluber and Bieber from the modern era, Gaylord Perry, even though the team wasn't much to brag about, but Gaylord Perry's in that mix, let alone going back to Bob Feller and, and Bob Lemon and, and, and Garcia and early win and that crew. So a uh, fascinating question, that's for sure. All right, thank you for your questions. By, uh, fire uh, away every single week on our show. We enjoy uh, the Ask Bruce segment very much. And I want to conclude this week by pointing out, Ryan, correct me if I'm wrong, does the Masters at Augusta National start three weeks from Thursday? I think it does. The Masters start Monday, April 8th. No, it starts on a Thursday. Oh, that must be the, right. So <laughs> that would be the 11th? Okay. 11th. So, okay. Scotty Scheffler is making a statement. He won the Arnold Palmer at bay. And then last week he won the players. And, boy, did he have stiff competition last week with Shafley. Wyndham Clark won the U.S. Open last year. Garmin. I mean to tell you, this Scheffler. Now, going into the Masters, how do you not make him the favorite? I don't know who else you can categorize as the favorite, but remember this. There's guys on that live like Brooks, Brooks Kepka. DeChambeau, not so much. Rom, it's going to be fascinating. Augusta National and the Masters, 
only a few weeks away. And we'll preview that with golf professionals here on Bonus Time with Drennan. And that's all the time we have for our show this week here on the Big Play Sports Network. I'm Bruce Drennan on behalf of Neil Smith. You have a great week. And until next week and next week's version of the show, as always, most importantly, don't forget, I love you, Ohio.